Yeah, thanks everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, so like Jason said, uh, so I work with the U.S. I work for the U.S. Geological Survey, and I'm located at Penn State University. And I'm going to talk about uh, three pretty large. I'm going to be talking about three. Sorry about that. Thank you. Uh, large telemetry studies that uh, my students and I have done over the past about eight years, and there's probably many of you in the room that have helped with these projects. Uh, they generally uh, take a lot of manpower, people power, um, to get done. So uh, thanks to everyone in the room that's helped throughout the years. Uh, and all this is really relevant here in all the talks today about connectivity, when we're talking about culverts or gene flow and so forth. So um, the, uh, yeah, let's, okay, we'll go with it. Uh, the first uh, slide here is just, you know, why do we carry out movement? And I think that's, uh, you know, pretty evident to, to most of us in the room. Uh, the, the first one is that it just improves our understanding of fish ecology. You know, fish move for a variety of reasons, to find thermally suitable habitat or habitat that offer some other limiting resources for food, for reproduction, and so forth. Uh, the other from, you know, for anglers, understanding fish movements is going to tell anglers something about, you know, understanding the target fish, you know, where potentially to target their efforts during certain times of years. Back to this idea of habitat connectivity, uh, the potential for gene flow, uh, and this can also help inform fish management in terms of stocking decisions. Uh, typically when we do uh, telemetry studies, we're also concurrently doing habitat use studies. When we locate fish in the stream, we, we take note of what type of habitat they are using to evaluate uh, habitat use over space and time. So uh, although I won't be talking about habitat use today, that's something that these studies provide really fine level detail of information about. They also help us understand uh, population dynamics, information uh, from telemetry studies can be incorporated into population dynamics models, which can then help us inform uh, management strategies. It can also help us inform just what are the environmental drivers of flow. Are these fish moving for, you know, reproductive purposes or are, are there other environmental stimulus that are pushing fish to move? Is it, is it flow related, temperature related? And therefore understanding that helps us understand, well, if flow and temperature do change in the future, uh, how much might that then affect fish movement? Uh, and also from a fisheries management perspective, understanding, you know, the, the kind of this basic fish ecology understanding, understanding fish movement it can help aid in designing and implementing fishery assessment tools. So when, where, and why would we deploy gear to sample fish? And that's going to obviously feed into helping uh, manage fish populations. And that's really the bottom line, you know, the, the, that all the above points that Understanding fish movement is important for the sustainable, uh, for sustainable fisheries management. So these studies, they're often, you know, they are a large undertaking and they take a lot of work and, and a lot of good grad students, uh, they, they do provide a lot of useful information for, for both recreational anglers uh, and management. So I'm going to talk about the three, uh, three studies we've done over the past about eight, nine years. Uh, they haven't lasted that long. We've done three studies. Each of them have been between four to about eight months in duration. The, the little transmitters that I'll show you that we put in the fish have a limited life uh, expectancy. So the studies don't last uh, very long and largely because brook trout are small. So we need small tags that have small batteries. But all the studies have three uh, common objectives or themes that we're interested in learning about. Uh, one of them is obviously seasonal moving pa uh, patterns. So we, we tag fish and we track their movements over different seasons of interest. And that's typically going from summer through the fall, through the spawning season, and then into the winter. Although we are interested in winter and especially spring movement, it's a lot more difficult to get onto these streams in January, sample and, and perform a surgery on a fish when it's very cold out. So we haven't done that yet. Uh, also, we look at what these in, might be env environmental or other drivers of movement. And then the studies are all also done in combination. Uh, they have been done in combination with evaluation of habitat use, like I mentioned. Also genetic diversity. So this work is done in uh, collaboration with, with Meredith's lab in Lamar uh, to get an understanding not only of, you know, we have fish moving, but do we also see, uh, you know, successful reproduction in terms of gene flow in the system as well. 
So here are the results before we talk about how we do this, just to give you some of the take home messages that I'll revisit at the end. Uh, and as reflected in the title, uh, we have a, there's a large variability among individual fish. Like we have a large variability among individual people. And our activity levels, uh, you know, some are movers and some are stayers. So we have some fish that might sit in the same pool for four months, and we have some fish that might move six and a half miles in a couple, you know, in a week. The movement rates are also stream specific and vary over time. So stream specific, typically high gradient streams, we see fish move less. Uh, and streams uh, and vary over time. Generally in the summertime, we don't see a lot of movement, uh, but definitely during the spawning season, we get an uptick of uh, and fish, you know, move out to spawn and then a post-spawn movement. So there's a uh, definite seasonality to, to, to how much they move. And as I mentioned, so moving associated with spawning is, is the largest pulsing movement that we see, although we see movement other times of the year. In terms of uh, how movement is related to fish size, sometimes we see big fish move long distances, but we also see uh, small fish move long distances. So it's not always that the big fish move and the small fish stay. Uh, it's kind of unpredictable in terms of using size or weight of a fish to, to determine if it's going to move a lot. In terms of the important environmental drivers, what we've seen so far is that flow is the, the biggest trigger for movement. Uh, generally in the summer, low flows, these fish hunker down in pools. We'll get a, you know, a, a big rainstorm. It can happen in the summer or you know, often in the fall, and we see a lot of fish just pick up and take off. And a lot of those movements in the fall are them taking off. That flow triggers them to take off and find, you know, start moving towards spawning habitat. And you know, of, of really of great interest to us is understanding, you know, uh, you know, the main stem tributary use of brook trout. So we, we typically in the summertime, you go up to the, the cold tributaries and you're fishing for brook trout, and they might be connected to a larger main stem. Um, that might be, season, see, you know, for the summer, thermally unsuitable, too warm. Uh, but we're interested in, in how, you know, how important those main stems are for corridors for dispersal uh, to help maintain gene flow and other populations. And also the idea that if, if, there needs, if something happened in a stream, is there a recolonization potential for, for brook trout to use those main stems as, as movement corridors? And in all of this, the studies that we have, the three studies that we've done, two of the main stems I would call thermally unsuitable in the summer, but we, and, but we do see these fish move, use those main stems uh, once the temperatures come down and, and they move them after spawning, they'll move into the winter. And although we haven't been able to track the fish through the winter and into the spring, but we do see that it looks like those fish are coming back out of those rivers once they start warming up and into the tributaries for the summer. So that main stem tributary exchange looks like to be, you know, important in a lot of systems. So the three study sites, that, the three studies that we've done, one was done, the first one, first one we did, it was in Fishing Creek, just up the road, upstream of, of Meredith's Lab in Lamar, looking at Cherry Run. Uh, whoops. Thanks. As the, uh, so here we have Lamar and Fishing Creek. Cherry Run, we tagged fish in Cherry Run, both the lower end and all up high in Cherry Run, and then we had a couple of smaller trips that we tagged fish in. Uh, we also did a thermometry study in, in Hunts Run watershed. And so if we zoom in, we tagged fish in, in uh, many of these tributaries feeding into Hunts Run, which, uh, which is this blue stream, and, the, and it's uh, connected to the, the Driftwood Branch, the Cinnamon Hunt Creek, which in the summertime, you probably wouldn't call it a brook trout stream. This is an example where we see fish uh, move out of these cold water tribs and into um, the driftwood branch in the, in the uh, late fall. And then the study that just wrapped, well, we have part of it still going, but the telemetry study wrapped up last year um, it is a Loyal, Loyal Salt Creek watershed. And here we had three streams that we had fish tagged. One in double run, uh, fish in Double Run, Shanerberg, and Pole Bridge, and obviously they were all uh, feeding into the, the Loyal Sock. And so when we perform telemetry studies, uh, like I said, when we do want to understand fish movement, there's a lot of different approaches we can take. These are all radio telemetry studies, which means we need a transmitter that we 
put in a fish and then we track them uh, using an antenna. And so we manually, we being grad students, go out and track fish for four months um, and, and locate individual fish. So we use backpack electric fishing to capture the brook trout. These are what the transmitters look like. This, this, up, this transmitter here, so here's a penny. This, upper, this transmitter is a large one that we've used in smallmouth bass just for comparison. This little transmitter here is what we uh, typically would put in a brook trout. They only weigh, uh, you know, m maybe two grams, so they're, they're, they're very small. And, they're, and they're, so that means we can be minimally invasive when we, we implant them. They are surgically implanted, and they're light enough where they're not inhibiting brook trout behavior at all. I don't know how well you can see these pictures, but after we capture the brook trout, we have a uh, surgical table that we deploy stream side. Uh, we do have to surgically implant the brook trout. They're anesthetized, and they have, uh, we have water being pumped over their gill continuously during the surgical procedure. And once the, the tag is uh, implanted in the, the fish, there's a, a wire that, that comes out the side of the, uh, the transmitter that allows us to track them. And uh, we suture them up just like you'd get sutured up you know, if you went to the doctor. The fish are allowed to recover in net, in net pins in the stream, and we have really uh, high recovery. Basically, our surgical process and are, is really good. These fish survive, they recover. Uh, we have basically no mortality due to the surgical procedure um, you know, after we release these fish. And I'm just going to jump down here since uh, some of the trees will show a video. Video here. Of what a fish looks like once it's immediate re immediately released. Again, it might be a little hard to see some of this here. I'll try to point some things out. But when we release these fish, we'll wait about a week before we track them just to make sure that their behavior that we observe and their movements isn't affected by the surgery that they had just undergone. Um, and each of these tags in the most recent study, well, are all the tags uh, that we've used when we locate a fish using the, you know, our antenna. So I don't know if you can see here, there's an antenna trailing out the side of the fish there. So this is the brook trout that was just dumped in the water. Um, and again, they, they tend to be right at home real quick. Uh, but every time we locate, for example, this fish, with each fish we have a unique ID that's transmitted back to us. So when we find a fish, we know that this is fish number 27, for example. So we can locate, we know each, each individual's history of movement uh, through time and also what habitat it would be using. Uh, we also have some tags that will transmit back the water temperature that these fish are using. So every time we find a fish, we know where it is, who it is, and the water temperature that it's using, because a lot of the questions, some of the questions that we have pertain to brook trout are about thermal habitat use, for example. Um, so we'll stop that, but that's you know, generally what these fish look like. They're pretty happy when they are let go. And, So then we track these fish for, you know, again, between four to, we've gone up to about eight months or so. And again, we're recording a lot of information, but today I'll just talk about the movements. Um, and for the Fishing Creek study, so every time we locate the fish, we, we take a GPS uh, location that has, you know, very low measurement error, so we're able to get that location very, quite precisely and be able to quantify movement. Uh, in Fishing Creek, the total movement over a four-month period, this was our shortest study, ranged from, again, 50 meters. So an individual fish moved just 50 meters over four months, um, up to over five and a half miles. So again, a, a very uh, wide range in, in how much this, these fish are moving. Average movements uh, depend on the stream. So in a high, higher gradient stream, a fish on average uh, only moves, you know, 65 feet over four months. Whereas in some areas, you know, they moved close to 500 feet. In the Hunts Run watershed, uh, just breaking movement down a little, a little bit differently, the maximum upstream movement was point, about 0.7 miles. 
And most of the fish movement that we see, we saw in Huntsrum was downstream. So a lot of the movement then we see, um, the largest movement was about 6.3 miles. And that was moving all the way down into the driftwood branch. Uh, and for the Loyal Saw Creek study that we have going on, or that we just finished, we don't have these statistics uh, summarized yet. But I'll show you a graph that shows you know, some of the movement patterns that we've seen. And a lot of it is downstream into the Loyal Saw post-spawn. This is just to uh, visually show the, the movement for the individual fish. This is from fish, the Fishing Creek study. So we have negative numbers here. This is all downstream movement. Above this line is upstream movement. And these are all individual fish and from the different streams. But basically, we see you know, large downstream movements that occurred. And these were, uh, in, in the Fishing Creek study, often the larger fish there moved large uh, distance downstream. These fish that didn't move at all, or very little, were typically in the smaller tributaries. There's an unnamed tributary and, and uh, bear run that, that fish didn't move uh, much in. And the fish in the middle were, were the ter cherry run fish. So again, kind of system specific, size, stream size specific movement patterns there. For the Hunt's Run uh, watershed, we're gonna zoom in on Whitehead Run, which is a tributary uh, to Hunt's Run. And I think I'm gonna have to push a button again. So in these next two uh, slides, there's an orange dot, which is the current location of the fish, and there's the date. And there's two trailing dots, which are um, the two previous days. But here's just October through December for an individual fish and whitehead run. And so here's you know, one, of those, uh, one of those stayers. So again, from October to December, this fish basically hung out within you know, a 20-meter stretch of stream. Um, including the spawning season. So it, 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 that fish didn't really go anywhere. You can contrast that to uh, this fish. There's, there it is in October. And then in November, it, he, that fish moved you know, quite quickly through November, December, down into uh, the driftwood branch of Simone Creek. And then stayed there till, the, till our transmitter died. We did have several fish moved into the driftwood branch, and we had actually one of them was, I think just one or two, were harvested in the springtime, and we, we uh, I think, got the transmitter back from one of them. So they, they stayed in there most likely throughout the entire winter. Um, and if we had two of our, you know, handful of fish that we tagged move in, you know, it's probably safe to assume that there were other brook trout that moved in to utilize that habitat during the winter as well. So I'm getting at the drivers of movement. Uh, here we have movement on the, the side of the graph line. And these arrows are pointing at high flow events. And so this is also from Hunt's Run. It was a really hot, dry summer. These fish didn't move. Right when we got uh, high flow events, movement picked up. And that also corresponded with the spawning period and some post-spawn movement. And this is f in that study, we also tagged brown trout. So we saw this for. All trout combined for brook trout and for brown trout. They were all queuing off high flow events to get up and move. And then here's some temporal kind of visualization for movement that we've seen in the Loyal Salt Creek watershed. Here's distance from the starting location or from where we, we, we released the fish, which is where we captured the fish. Uh, this is upstream, this is downstream movement. The shaded box would be, they move downstream enough that they're now in the Loyal Salt. And there's three different color colored lines that correspond to the three tributaries. But basically, throughout the summer, we see some upstream movement of some fish. And they move up, and they just stay in that spot for quite a while in a lot of cases. Um, and then after, then during spawning, and especially post-spawn, we see movement then back down out of those tributaries um, and into the loyal sock. And it's really hard to sample the loyal sock for brook trout. And it's hard to track fish there. So um, you know, how long they stayed there and or what they did afterwards, we're not sure. And that's basically when the study ended and when the, the uh, transmitters die. So just to wrap some things up, I mean, as been, what has been talked quite a bit about today, the importance of connectivity. Uh, you know, these tributaries adjacent to main stems uh, provide important spawning habitat. So if fish are using those main stems for other resources, they're, you know, these tributaries are moving up for cold water, they're moving up to spawn. Those main stems, in a lot of cases, are providing that dispersal corridor, not in the summertime, but during the winter and spring months. 
um, and potentially other resources that might benefit these fish as well. And again, some fish utilize that, utilize those main stems, and other fish stay in, in those, those smaller tributaries. And when we think about in all the studies and really in, in trial, we see these, we see movers, we see stayers. Uh, we don't know if these are two different kind of life histories, if we want to call them that, or behavior types. Um, there are risks to moving, there's risks to staying, but there's obviously some benefits. Um, and those risky move, those fish that take that risk to move are, are the ones that you know, help maintain population connectivity and connecting genetic material to, to st neighboring streams potentially. The cautious stayers are going to, you know, maybe assure higher, higher survival. They're not moving into a stream full of smallmouth bass and brown trout. Um, but if this is the case, you know, we, we do, I think we need to think about that in terms of, you know, maintaining these behavior types to, to maintain these metapopulation dynamics that we observe in a lot of these systems. Um, so whether that be in, when we think about harvesting or th term, think about stocking or, or how we think about managing or con conserving these populations moving forward, thinking about these behaviors uh, is going to be important as well. And I don't know if you can see that, but that is a frog. So I'll stop there. Uh, there's a lot of hungry, hungry fish waiting for uh, you, you guys to go catch tonight. Thank you, Tyler.